Gregory Nemet is a professor uh, at the University of Wisconsin's La Follette School of Public Affairs and author of the second edition of How Solar Energy Became Cheap, Pathway to a Solar-Centric Economy. So welcome to the interview, Greg. Thanks, Mark. I'm good to be here. I interviewed you two or three years ago when the first edition came out, and this one uh, takes the argument, I think, to its logical conclusion, which is that um, solar is the way to um, clean up the supply side of the energy system, and electrification of demand is cleans up the, the and they work together. And I, I, for me, that was the core argument of the book. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of give us an overview. Yeah, I mean, I wrote the book originally eight years ago to understand how solar got cheap so we could create a playbook for other technologies that we'd need. And that's what the book was about. And I've updated it since then. And, and one of the questions I had was, is it even worth updating? It's a historical view, what's happened since then. As I started looking at what's happened with solar in the six or seven years since the first edition, a lot has changed. And so much has changed that it's really starting to maybe focus more not on what we can learn from solar for other technologies, but also tell the story of what does it mean if solar just keeps going in the direction and at the pace that it has been going. Not talking about speeding up or some breakthrough or some new change, just keep going. Have the driving forces that have been in place for many years now if they keep going, where do we get to? And that's why I started talking about it as a solar centric economy, because it doesn't take very long until solar is at the core of the energy system rather than on the margins. And that that changes some things. Um, uh, Kingsmill Bond, uh, who's now with Ember Energy, uh, told me two, three years ago, he said, what will happen is renewables will, first of all, they'll take all the growth. Then they'll cut into the, you know, sort of the core of the uh, electricity or the energy, uh, the energy system. And I think we're up to what now for wind and solar, what about 90 percent, 95 percent of growth? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of the things that that strikes me, because you live in Wisconsin, I live in, in, in Canada and our audiences, North Americans, don't seem to get what's going on in the rest of the world where solar is just taking global energy, or, you know, national energy systems by storm, as is the electrification of demand, like EVs and, and heat pumps. Yeah, and that's something that's happened very quickly in the eight years since the first edition of the book, is seeing how solar has grown in many different places. I mean, a few points I'd make on that. One, um, we have places like Australia, and particularly South Australia, that are doing large portions of their electricity demand from solar and making that grid reliable and work well and wanting to do even more solar um, because you can do lots of solar when you have complementary technologies like low-cost batteries, which we now have, and invest in grid infrastructure. So that's one thing we see. A second thing is that we see faster growth in solar in the global south than we do in rich countries. So this idea that solar is a luxury good for the rich, but the poor need fossil fuels to develop. That doesn't seem to be what uh, what developing countries are deciding to do as they're growing faster with solar than even rich countries are. So that's a big change. And I guess the third thing to think about is more than 90% of the solar industry is outside of North America. And I think as we uh, live in North America and, and to digest the discourse on energy and the choices we have available, uh, it is important to understand what's happening in the rest of the world and that the decisions that do happen in North America, some of them affect the rest of the world, but a lot of them don't. In a lot of cases, especially with solar, uh, other parts of the world are just charging ahead because it's such an opportunity to have reliable, low-cost, clean electricity. Is that why you say that India is the key market going forward? India is important because it's so big and it hasn't fully developed yet. So whether India grows in the way that China has grown or whether it picks its own path that looks more like the way China is growing now and focuses on taking advantage of electrification and low cost energy like solar and doing domestic manufacturing and leaving a lot of its fossil fuels, especially coal in the ground. That's a choice that India has available. They are investing in solar. They are investing in manufacturing of solar, despite the tremendous advantages that China has had uh, by developing its industry over the last 20 years. So India is only 
3% of global manufacturing of solar, but it wants to scale up quickly. And even if all it does is just meet its own demand for solar energy, uh, that's substantial because then India can see solar as something that can make it self-sufficient, um, not just in producing electricity, but in acquiring the equipment to produce electricity. And that's that's a real opportunity for India. So yeah, I would look at India as an important country here. Now, you mentioned the Global South earlier, and that's important to me because uh, we've done many videos here at Energy Media about the uh, oil demand modeling. And the a couple of key ones are uh, the International Energy Agency, which is kind of a middle ground, but optimistic. And then there's OPEC, which uh, basically says that uh, clean energy technologies like solar and EVs are really expensive. They're, they only work if they're subsidized. And and it expects the global south to stick with oil with oil and gas, and then it goes on to model you know oil demand growing out to twenty fifty, and it's widely quoted in the oil the oil industry but like it's it's like the Bible, and it's wrong, and the last year or two and China in particular its move into the global south has demonstrated just how wrong it is. Uh, I I want I'll just throw that out back to you for comment. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good way to put it. I mean, I think what makes that assumption about fossil fuels forever and oil forever wrong is that the alternatives have emerged and they work, they're affordable, and increasingly they're really appealing. Like an EV built in China with full, you know, electrification of navigation and information and and entertainment and eventually automation of self-driving, like that's all happening very quickly. That seems super appealing. You don't need gasoline to fuel that car. You've got electricity coming from solar renewables and other sources. And so that just feels like a much more appealing choice to make than to build an infrastructure based on fossil fuels because everybody knows at this point what happens when you become dependent on fossil fuels. And there are actually very few countries in the global south that produce their own oil and enough for domestic consumption. So they become importers, they become dependent, they become vulnerable to oil price shocks that happen regularly. And it, we know because it's such an interconnected industry that a conflict in the Middle East or in Ukraine or somewhere else has impacts on prices everywhere in the world that uses oil. So if you can find a way to fuel your economic development and not depend on oil, you can plan for the future and you have a much brighter future and a more stable one. Um, we're going to finish up this overview of your book uh, with this question, and that is uh, solar at utility scale versus distributed solar on rooftops, community solar, that sort of thing. Um, so far, most of the growth or a lot of the growth has been at the at grid scale. Are you... Do you expect that as we go forward, it'll in fact, it'll be the distributed use of solar that will dominate? Well, it's come back, the distributed part of solar. So originally, the small scale solar was got was what got solar going. And it was only when solar got cheap enough to really compete with centralized fossil fuels in the 2010s that we had utility scale solar. And utility scale solar is cheaper because you spread fixed costs around across many more megawatt hours of electricity. So we have seen huge growth in utility scale solar. But what, I, what I've noticed in updating the book for the last five or six years of data is that the percent uh, that's distributed solar, small scale rooftop solar, has been rising over the last five years. And I think it's because we've got new types of consumers that are getting into the act. They're especially in developing countries doing small scale electrification. And we've seen it in Pakistan in the last couple of years, and we're seeing it in other places as well. So there is something about this modularity of solar, this small scale combined with the low cost that lets people do lots of different things with solar and they don't need to be centrally planned. They don't need to be massive investments. They can be playing around the edges, but that has lead to a lot of adoption of solar. And now we see more growth in rooftop solar than we have in centralized solar. So that's an interesting development in the last five years.